We're going to talk about uh, MR of the knee. Uh, first and foremost, before I begin, MR of the knee is a broad topic, so what we're going to do is hit some highlights and focus on the things that you're going to need as you practice. First off, we're going to talk about protocol, the menisci, the cruciate and collateral ligaments, patella and its surrounding structures, the bursas of the knee, cartilage pathology, and the bones. First, uh, protocol. So there's a million ways to image the knee, and it's mostly on preference. You can go on a different university and they'll have a different protocol. Some might even have fat suppressed images only, basically on preference and depending on how you practice and the kind of population that you have. Most agree that there's dedicated surface coils that you can use uh, to better image the knee. And the parameters are again pretty much standard throughout, except that some people or some universities or uh, imaging centers will focus on the positioning. Mostly here at the University of Washington, we have a five degree external rotation. This is in line with the uh, anterior cruciate ligament, which MR of the knee is sensitive for. The sequences that we use here, uh, we have five main sequences with the inclusion of a coronal T1 weighted image. For our population, we see a bunch of we see a lot of marrow abnormalities as well as tumors, so we do include that. Most imaging centers and universities don't have that. And the use of contrast, well, we, we don't use contrast in a routine knee, with the exception of a post-surgical knee if the orthopedic surgeon requests it. Now, to begin, uh, we talk about the menisci, which is an important topic in MR imaging of the knee. So we talk about the menisci. The menisci, there's a lateral and a medial, and it's a fibrocartilaginous structure as opposed to the hyaline cartilage and uh, the articular surfaces. It's C-shaped, and you can see the outline uh, in the image to your right, uh, the edges of the C-shaped meniscus, and as you can also see, it's a little bit thicker in the posterior aspect. In terms of anatomy, to describe the abnormalities, you have to locate where in the meniscus it is. So I have a diagram here on the right where you can see uh, it's divided into three sections, the anterior and posterior horns, and in the middle, the body. There are arrows in the more central portion of the meniscus where you see the roots. And from the periphery to the center, it tapers in the, it's also good to note that the vascular regions of the meniscus is in the peripheral side. So if you have an abnormality or a tear, it's most likely not going to be repaired if it's in the more central free edge. Rather, it'd be resected or um, shaved off. Whereas in the periphery where there's vasculature, that can be repaired. So when you image, a knee, for example, you start from the peripheral sides uh, on a sagittal sequence. You see bow tie appearance. And as you go from periphery, from the periphery to the center, you see the middle, at the middle part of that meniscus shrink down and, and you see a bow tie, sequential bow tie appearance. The typical measurement of a meniscus when you see it on, um, on the coronal is about nine millimeters. So with a slice thickness of about four millimeters or three millimeters, you can either see three or two bow ties. Keep in mind that the medial, uh, the medial meniscus, the posterior horn is much larger, sometimes one and a half times larger than the anterior horn. And when you look at the lateral side, they're equal. The diagram on the right shows a sequential from the periphery to the central part of the meniscus and you see how it triangulates on both sides. So here it is, the normal meniscus. It's all low signal, low signal in all sequences. And make sure you scrutinize the, the morphology of it. 
the signal, and especially the articular surfaces. Now, there are some uh, grading schemes that are used, uh, but really, I mean, when it really comes down to it, in general practice, you don't use them. It's better to describe it because oftentimes the orthopedic surgeons have different grading systems of their own, or they don't even use it themselves. So, an abnormal uh, meniscus, again, morphology, signal, and uh, the articular surface, that's what we need to look at. Here's an abnormal meniscus where you can see the morphology is a little bit different. You see high signal as well in the inferior articular surface, and it just doesn't look right. When you look at anteriorly, uh, you see a nice triangle. So there's a big difference. So you, you already know that there's some abnormality here. Here, you do see that it's in the periphery, but not you don't see it going through the uh, articular surface. Here, on the other hand, you see it on both sides. You see disruption of the articular surface, and you see high signal within that fractured meniscus. So as the fluid seeps in through the crack, you, it's, better, it's better visualized on MR. Now, sometimes you have different signal within the meniscus. Uh, most of the time, the majority of the MRs that you're going to see, you will see uh, mixoid or intrasubstance degeneration. And as you see it, you see that there's no articular disruption. Sometimes these are not due to degenerative causes. Other times it's acute. It could be a contusion or it could be chondrocalcinosis. So it's really important to correlate this with a plain film if you can see calcifications or little punctate opacities on uh, x-ray then you can be certain that that's chondrocalcinosis. Also uh, vascularity sometimes you can see vascularity in the periphery like I, I mentioned earlier and that high signal could be due to that as well. Now when you see a men uh, meniscal cyst or parameniscal cyst usually you will see a parameniscal cyst if the fluid within the cyst has, uh, within the meniscus has extruded away, it becomes a, a parameniscal cyst. And even when you don't see a tear, you can pretty much be certain that there is one. So again, there are many ways to categorize meniscal tears. The, there are various now that are in uh, the uh, recent articles, but I like to view it in, in, in terms of geometry and direction. These are the basic types. The top, the top image uh, is a horizontal. So you're, you're looking at this from either a coronal or a sagittal view. And you see a horizontal line across the uh, meniscus. Oftentimes, you can also see an oblique and a vertical. And we will go into these. Another type is a radial tear. So when you, this is on an axial view, and you can see a radial tear or a free edge tear that violates the inner margin of the meniscus. Okay, first the oblique or horizontal. As you can see, on this uh, image on your right, there's violation of the inferior articular surface. Now, you usually see this in degenerative processes in people with severe osteoarthritis, and it's usually in the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. When you look at a vertical or longitudinal tear, you see on the bottom left image, it's separating the inner and outer portions of the meniscus. And when you look at it on a coronal sequence, you see a line through that, and it just goes around the length of the meniscus. Now this is a subtype of a vertical tear, which is a bucket handle tear. When you see the inner portion of the, uh, the tear as it comes out, so it feels like when you're looking at a, a bucket with a handle up, that's, what it, that's why it's called a bucket handle tear, and it usually displaces into the intercondylar notch, as you see here on the right, that low T2 or fluid sensitive signal that's in the intercondylar notch here on the image to your right. And you see as it connects anteriorly, there's a little curve, which is a part of that 
meniscus that's still intact. Okay, here's another coronal view of the bucket handle tear. Now, when you're looking at this from uh, a sagittal view, as, and you imagine from the peripheral, going from the peripheral to the central portion, uh, you see, again, we would normally see bow ties, sometimes two, most of the time two, sometimes three, larger patient. And when, as you move sequentially from, peripher from the peripheral aspect to the central aspect, you will see an, uh, an absent bow tie sign. And uh, again, you'll see that the, the inner, inner part of the meniscus has gone into the intercondylar notch. Oftentimes, you can also see a double PCL sign where it seems like there's two PCLs, but usually the inferior curved uh, low signal is actually, it's the, actually the bucket handle uh, portion of that uh, meniscus. Uh, the double PCL sign, though, is not uh, specific to uh, bucket handle tear. You can also see this in uh, uh, ACL tear, where the ACL has torn proximally and it is uh, laying curved down, very similar to a bucket handle tear. Now, one thing that I, I do want to mention is that these have variations. So these can, uh, most of the time, they'll displace into the intercondylar notch. But these, the inner piece can also displace anteriorly, where, where you call it an anterior flipped bucket handle tear, or it can displace posteriorly as well. So there are variations. So it's better to describe these so that the orthopedic surgeon can know how to treat it and have an idea before they go in to fix it. So free edge tears or radial tears, they can be partial or full width. Uh, as you can see the, the illustration here, just imagine uh, that you're going from the periphery again and centrally, uh, you will see a little nick in the bow tie where it separates too, separates too early. Sometimes when it's a full, uh, full width tear, uh, you can actually see that there is no bow tie when you look at it in the sagittal sequence. Here's an example of a partial width free edge tear or radial tear, as you can see. Now, uh, this is more located in the anterior lateral, more anterior body, a junction of the anterior body, um, anterior horn and the body. So when you look at this on a sagittal uh, sequence, most likely you're not going to see the uh, cleft. But on an, on an axial sequence, you see that there is a tear. Now, um, this can also uh, have a variation. There is a uh, tear called the parrot beak, where there is a radial tear and that extends into a longitudinal or vertical tear. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have an example of that. Here's a full width radial tear. Uh, and on the axial image, you can clearly see that there's interruption of that meniscus. Now, when you look at it on a coronal, uh, when you're parallel uh, to the tear, and you'll basically see nothing. It'll be a ghost meniscus where, where you would expect to see one. What happens when you have a, a, a complete or full width radial tear. Basically, you lose the tensile strength of the, uh, the cartilage. So the hoop strength of that, uh, car uh, sorry, that meniscus has, you've already lost it, so it extrudes. So you can see here on the image on the right, it's off of the tibial plateau. That's how you can diagnose extrusion of the meniscus. You base it on the tibial plateau. Here's another uh, variation of uh, a tear where you see that the inferior margin has been violated, but the actual flap piece has migrated medially. So this can be missed during arthroscopy when, a, uh, when the orthopedic surgeon looks at this. Sometimes when uh, the free edge is intact, they won't be able to see uh, the actual tear. So it's good to mention these when you see them on MR. Also, um, I included the meniscal capsular tears uh, into this section because there's supposed to be a, a connection between the medial collateral ligament and the 
body of the uh, medial meniscus. When you see a separation like that, and you see high signal in between the two structures, you know that you have a uh, meniscal capsule or tear. And again, uh, it's important to scrutinize uh, that, it's, that there's fluid signal in between all the parts of that, uh, that articulation. Otherwise, uh, sometimes when there's a short portion tear, um, it's usually not clinically relevant or significant. So moving on to uh, discoid meniscus, when uh, you would expect on a coronal view a, a triangular meniscus, like you see here on the lateral, on the medial, but oftentimes uh, in the 3% uh, of the time in the young adult or children, uh, in that population you'll see a, a discoid meniscus where it's instead of a C-shaped, it's a disc. So when you look at this on a sequential sagittal image, you won't see the bow ties, but you'll just see square, uh, rectangular low T1, uh, so low, low T1, T2 uh, signal. These are uh, a congenital malformation, and it's more common on the lateral meniscus than on the medial. Again, it's important to look at all the edges of these uh, discoid menis menisci, because sometimes you can see a Risberg variant, and a Risberg variant is basically the attachment to the posterior aspect of this disc, of this meniscus. A Risberg variant will only have a uh, meniscal femoral ligament attached to it, whereas a normal uh, non uh, Risberg variant will have the normal struts that attach the posterior aspect of this uh, meniscus to the posterior capsule. There are many pitfalls in evaluating uh, the menisci. Oftentimes you can see a transverse ligament that you can mistake for uh, an anterior horn tear. So it's important to follow these on a sagittal sequence and you'll see that it, if it's a transverse ligament, it'll connect to the, contra uh, the other side of the other meniscus. Oftentimes also near the intercondylar notch at the insertion of the, the tibial insertion of the ACL, you'll see a speckled appearance of an anterior horn lateral meniscus. Again, you can see on the image on the right, uh, you see that there's violation of the uh, articular surface, um, but again, um, that is a, a pitfall, and it's just good to know so you don't get fooled. We talked about the meniscofemoral ligament. Again, when you're looking at this uh, on the posterior horn on the lateral meniscus, sometimes this can simulate a tear. So again, Humphrey, if it's in front of the PCL or Risberg, if it's posterior. Because of the location of the uh, popliteal artery, you can have pulsation artifact. So make sure if you see artifact that goes across the, the image on a lateral, on a sagittal sequence, then that's probably pulsation artifact. And again, a magic angle phenomenon, which you normally see in the uh, more posterior aspect of the uh, menisci as it curves up and then down into the meniscal root. So now we're going to move on to the cruciate ligaments and the collateral ligaments. So the anterior cruciate ligament, a normal anterior or ACL or anterior cruciate ligament uh, is parallel to the intercondylar notch, or the roof of the intercondylar notch. And you normally see a low signal striation interlaced with high signal. And it's slightly oblique. Again, uh, we image the knee in a uh, five, five degrees external uh, rotation. It's like putting your hand in your pocket. Okay, that's the direction of the ACL from the femur to the tibia. So you can have a partial thickness or a full thickness tear. Oftentimes when you have a partial thickness tear, that's not repaired and conservative management um, is what the orthopedic surgeon chooses. If it's a full thickness tear, then um, that's most likely going to be surgical depending on the patient's activity level. So in uh, ACL tear, you see either uh, discontinuity of the ligamentous fibers or sometimes you can just see laxity. Remember, if, it's, if the ACL is lax, then it's not providing stability. Oftentimes in uh, traumatic acute trauma, you'll see a fracture um, and uh, the distal insertion of the uh, 
ACL, uh, ACL uh, will be attached to a, a fragment, a bone fragment. In, in the ACL, you can also have intrasubstance degeneration. Most of the time, you'll see abnormal signal, high uh, fluid sensitive signal, sometimes, uh, most of the time, intermediate, but you'll still see an intact fiber. You can see here in both the um, uh, sagittal PD and uh, T2 that there are some intact fibers in there, but there's too much signal. Uh, most of the time, you will see this in the uh, older patient. Okay. There are secondary signs um, that tell you, that indicate that there may be an ACL tear. It's really important to pay attention to the uh, bones and to see if there's high signal on T2 so you can locate these contusions. It'll signal that there's some abnormality. This is a typical pivot shift contusion that you see on your right. And actually, you also see a lateral femoral uh, notch sign where there's a sulcus that's deep, okay? Uh, oftentimes when you measure it, it's usually more than two millimeters in depth. This will signal that there might be uh, most likely uh, an ACL tear. Another sign that uh, you can see is at the anterior tibial translation. You measure the posterior aspect of that um, lateral femoral condyle um, and the distance between the posterior aspect of the uh, posterior aspect of the lateral tibial plateau. If it's more than seven millimeters, then uh, you can suspect that they're an ACL tear. So when the orthopedic surgeon uh, does his clinical exam and then there's an anterior drawer sign, uh, this is basically our imaging version of that. Um, oftentimes you can also see a buckled PCL, obviously an effusion, and sometimes uh, a Sagan uh, fracture, which is when you see that, uh, most likely more than 95% of the time that there'll be one, an ACL tear. We often image uh, a post-surgical knee and uh, ACL graft evaluation uh, is really important. Now it's important to note that when they do uh, uh, ACL repair, these are hard, the actual graft is uh, harvested from the uh, patellar tendon or sometimes the uh, hamstrings tendon. And you want to make sure that the uh, graft is taut and, it, and that it's parallel to the intercondylar, the roof of the intercondylar notch as you would see a uh, normal uh, ACL. So when they do the operation, they actually do this in uh, a flexion uh, position, so a flex knee. And they divide the uh, tibial plateau on a sagittal view into uh, quartiles, okay? And in the second quartile, that's where they put the, uh, the uh, tibial screw or the tibial tunnel so that it can be parallel to the roof of the intercondylar notch. And when you evaluate these, sometimes you can be fooled by the signal. Oftentimes this can be a heterogeneous or intermediate signal, and that can last for approximately uh, two years. Here's an example of a lax ACL graft, and you see that if it's lax, as in a native ACL, uh, it's not providing stability. Sometimes if the tunnel is too steep, uh, as they flex the knee, they can impinge the graft, and obviously that's more prone to injury, and we know that that graft won't last. Of course, you're not gonna mention that in your reports. Probably the orthopedic surgeon won't send you any more patients if you do that. <laughs> Another thing that you wanna watch out for are what they call cyclops lesion. They're called cyclops because it looks like an eye in the middle of the knee on the coronal, coronal uh, sequence. So here it is, it's actually scarring of, of the uh, surrounding tissues. So when the surgeon goes in there, obviously there's gonna be some scarring and fibrosis. And these cyclops lesion or arthrofibrosis can cause uh, pain and discomfort, especially when the patient extends the knee. A normal, normal uh, posterior cruciate ligament, again, uh, there's low signal and it's us it, you see a curved ligament that's attaching the uh, distal femur to the proximal uh, tibia. Now, uh, a PCL tear is not as, not as common as an ACL tear 
and uh, for a radiologist it's also a little bit harder uh, in comparison to evaluating an ACL uh, simply because oftentimes you don't even see complete uh, transection or uh, disruption of the ligament. Oftentimes it's only a thickened ligament with uh, intermediate signal. So it's, it's very diffi uh, difficult to differentiate a full, t uh, full width or full thickness tear from a partial thickness tear. Oftentimes these are not repaired. We're going to move on to the uh, collateral ligaments. First off, when, you, uh, when there's a collateral ligament injury, there's a grading system. Now this is more widely used. Okay? A grade one injury indicates a mild sprain or high signal superficially, sometimes uh, deep or both uh, to the uh, MCL. Grade two would be a severe sprain or a partial tear and a grade three would be a complete tear. So a medial, uh, the medial collateral ligament again, you see low signal on all sequences. It's an extrasynovial ligament and again the medial meniscus and the capsule are intimate to the uh, medial collateral ligament, especially in the, uh, when you image the knee on a coronal and the medial joint line right smack in the middle of that meniscus. Here is an example of a grade two severe sprain, partial thickness. You can see that uh, there's high signal in this MCL, but you still see continuity of the fibers. You do see the fluid deep and superficial to the ligament. So this is a grade two partial tear. And here's a difference, a grade three, where you can see a complete full thickness tear indicated by the arrow. Again, there's also meniscal capsular separation. Now, the uh, lateral collateral ligament complex is a little bit harder than the uh, MCL. Here is an extreme sagittal view of that lateral collateral ligament. Again, you would expect to see low signal. This image is called the, like, the bunny ear, where you see the insertion of the tendon of the biceps femoris, and you see the more to the left, the, the lateral collateral ligament. Now, the lateral, ligament, lateral collateral ligament complex has many structures. Okay, we've already mentioned uh, the biceps femoris and the, the true lateral collateral ligament, but there's also the iliotibial band, the arcuate ligament, and uh, the popliteofibular ligament, and there are many more. So this is a topic in and of its own. When you see these in combination, then you start to think about the posterior lateral corner injury, which leads us to this. Okay. So a posterior lateral uh, corner injury is defined as an injury to the uh, lateral collateral ligament in conjunction with, for example, a popliteus tendon, which you see here in the image, arcuate ligament, popliteal fibular ligament, the ACL or the PCL. This is actually uh, almost a, uh, an emergency situation uh, when you see this, and it's important to report this immediately to the surgeon. These can also be indicated by an arcuate fracture, which is the uh, fracture of the proximal fibula. So here in the image on the bottom left, you see discontinuity and a wavy appearance, the lateral collateral ligament. On the middle image, you see high signal intensity in the popliteal muscle, and you see that the dark T2 signal, just right superior lateral to that muscle, is the actual tendon that has been uh, retracted. And you see uh, the sagittal sequence on the bottom right and you see, you see that the ACL is not intact proximally. So when you see this, this picture in combination, you're already thinking of the posterior lateral corner injury. Sometimes this is the same image as the, uh, the previous. Sometimes you can have an isolated uh, popliteal tendon injury as well. Make sure to evaluate that when you look at these MRs. Now I included these in, the la in, the, uh, in this section because of its relationship with the other lateral ligaments. So the iliotibial band inserts into the lateral aspect of the tibial plateau and oftentimes uh, patients come in and they, they complain about a lateral knee pain and the, the surgeon or uh, a referring physician will uh, think that there's internal derangement but when in, rea in reality they only have fluid uh, deep to the uh, il iliotibial band and so that's called an il iliotibial iliotibial band friction syndrome and this usually happens to uh, runners and again it's anterolateral knee pain.
Moving on to the patella and surrounding structures. First off, we're going to talk about uh, patellar dislocation. It's really hard for the referring physicians uh, to diagnose these, especially because these dislocations reduce oftentimes on their own, so only half are detected. Here you see the characteristic contusions in the bone and the medial aspect of the patella and the lateral aspect of the distal femur. Oftentimes, when, as you see here in the image, there's injury to the medial retinaculum or the medial patellofemoral ligament. Uh, it's really important to see if there's cartilage damage uh, or cartilage damage in the patella uh, because that will most of the time signal uh, that the surgeon will have to uh, do arthroscopy or operate. In a patellar dislocation, you often see a hypoplastic trochlear notch. So you see here on the bottom left image that the curvature of that trochlea uh, is very defined, whereas here on the bottom right, it's almost a straight line. Uh, the bottom right image also shows a contusion indicating that there has been prior uh, injury, most likely a dislocate, lateral dislocation of that patella. You can measure these, and the trochlear depth should be uh, more than three millimeters. So oftentimes on the sagittal sequence, you'll see the patellar tendon. And again, it should be low, low signal in all sequences. And sometimes you see what's called the jumper's knee, where you see the proximal uh, insertion of this uh, tendon demonstrate high signal. And so oftentimes, it's, it's, uh, there's an accompanying uh, bone marrow edema in the, in the inferior patella. Uh, you see thickening and increased signal. And that's called a jumper's knee, and it's usually seen in uh, athletes, young athletes, uh, who participate in, in jumping wherever they do in their sport. A mimic of this, although the pain is a little bit more superior, is um, suprapatellar fat pad impingement. Now, you can also have this in Hoffa's fat pad. Um, basically, all you see is a signal abnormality in the fat above or below the, the patella, and uh, this can cause pain during flexion. Bursa, most important of these is the popliteal bursa, which we normally call the Baker cyst. And uh, it's important to note the location of this because it should be between the medial head of the uh, gastrocnemius and the semimembranous muscle or tendon. Okay, these can cause compartment syndromes and these, can, these are prone to rupture and cause inflammation in the surrounding tissues. So these can actually seep through the, the adventitia and can extend up above or below, can mimic a DVT. So it's important to note, especially if, it's, if the, the diameter is more than uh, one centimeter. The prepatellar uh, bursa, so you can have bursitis in the anterior aspect of the knee, anterior to the patella. It used to be called the housemaid's knee. This is caused by repetitive trauma from kneeling and basically, you see, you just see a low T1, high T2 signal, uh, or fluid collection, anterior to the patella, really easy to diagnose. Here's one that's not so easy. Um, the pes anserinus is basically the insertion of the gracilis tendon, the sartorius tendon, and the semitendinous tendon. And uh, I think pes anserinus means goose foot. Uh, it supposedly, it looks like a goose foot. But in any case, it inserts into the anterior uh, medial aspect of the distal, ti uh, distal uh, tibia. Sometimes you'll see fluid within the, the bursa, which indicate bursitis. Um, this can mimic internal derangement on clinical exam. So it's pretty important to mention it. Now, there are other bursas of the knee. Most of them are medial. You can have an MCL bursa semimembranosis, MCL bursa, but these two are, um, uh, these three are the most important ones. Moving on to cartilage pathology or winding down. Here is a normal, normal cartilage where you see intermediate signal on PD and on um, T2 or uh, PD fat suppressed. And you see lining the cortex which is lined by dark uh, signal. So it's uh, pretty important to 
uh, scrutinize this uh, because now there's a, a lot of research and new procedures that, uh, that uh, focus on the cartilage. Here, when you evaluate this, this can be acute or chronic. So you just make sure you look at the, the margins of this. If it's sharp, it's most likely acute. And then you look for secondary signs like bone contusions, as you see here. When it's chronic, you see the undulations of the cartilage. You see curved or sloped uh, appearances of the, of the cartilage. Oftentimes, you'll see high signal instead of an intermediate signal. Uh, and as in this case, sometimes you don't see them at all where there's a uh, full thickness cartilage. So make sure when you're reading uh, these MRs and, and you're evaluating the cartilage to use descriptors, either focal or global, partial thickness or full thickness. Uh, there's no adapted grading system to this, so the descriptors are really important. In this case, uh, when you see a delaminating component, which is cartilage loss but has extended uh, into the plane of the cartilage, so it's called a delaminating component. As you see here, it not only goes towards the bone, but parallel to the bone. It's important to note fissures and if there's underlying uh, signal abnormality in the bone. And speaking of bones, when we look at bone contusions, uh, you see an amorphous high T2 signal. This can be a uh, sole source of pain when, when you see this, uh, but oftentimes you'll see this in conjunction with other uh, abnormalities. So it's important to look for these. I especially like these in um, high T2, uh, sorry, in a T2 sequence or in sometimes in the uh, non-fat suppressed T1 where you can see signal abnormality and it'll indicate to you where the pathology is. These are micro fractures and um, they heal on their own. And lastly, osteonecrosis. Now, the general term for this is osteonecrosis. Once you see them in the epiphysis, um, they're called a vascular necrosis, or if in the, sh in the shaft you see, uh, you call them bone infarct. But, you know, they're all osteonecrosis, and it usually affects the yellow marrow. The causes, uh, causes of osteonecrosis, there are many causes of these, and there's even a mnemonic. Um, but mainly, when you look at the, the history, you know, think about trauma, steroids, sickle cell anemia, collagen vascular disease, alcoholism, pancreatitis, and AIDS. I have collagen vascular disease here uh, highlighted because this patient actually had lupus. Here is the same patient on an axial image, typical of what you see, low T1 and low T2 serpiginous lines, and here you actually see the double line sign. Now it's not required for you to see the double line sign to call uh, osteonecrosis.